Barnes? Present. Bowersox? Present. Lewis? Present. Roberts? Present. Smythe? Here. Stevenson? Present. Mayor Pressing? Here. Chair Chenoweth? Present. I believe we're all on board. Uh, are there additions to the agenda this evening? No additions? Is there a staff report? Not this time. Okay, great. I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. So moved. I have a motion second. from Charlie and a second from Brandon. Mayor. Um, I would like to add, it says committee members present, uh, Mayor Laurel Pressing. Okay, we can add that. It is the case that I actually was committee, present. Yes, a committee. You are a committee member. It should say also present Mayor Laurel Pressing probably. Because I don't think I vote on everything, but I do get asked if I'm here. Isn't it yeah, correct? I might as well note it in the minutes. I believe you're a committee member, but not a council member. No, you're Something. present at committees. That's right, correct. Right. You're I'm just present. not a committee member. Okay. So, so it would be also present. present also present, Mayor Laurel Pressing. Also, because present. I I will vote on on well maybe I won't vote on this committee stuff, but would um. Would uh, Charlie and Brandon, would you take that as a friendly amendment to yes, your motion? Yes. Okay. Are there any other changes to the minutes? Okay. If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? That carries. Next, we will hear from members of the public. There are two options for members of the public. You can either speak at this time, at the beginning of the meeting, or you can also speak at the time of the, of the agenda item. And there's a list of the agenda items in the back that tells you what the order is. So. You just fill out one of these and bring it to me or the clerk. First, we'll hear from Julie Watkins. She's at 805 East Green Street talking about the number of unrelated individuals. Uh, hello, you already gave my address. Um, I had a, question, um, a comment from last week also that the, in regards to the pedestrian bridge, it seems that that doesn't seem, I don't think that's good public money for us to do all of it. And that if I understand what was said, I don't think it's the city's responsibility that that building doesn't have an elevator. So uh, what I wanted to talk on here is I was reading over the um, documents that you had on the web and I'm kind of confused about what's the ordinance about that you only can have four unrelated people and what's the reasoning for it um, because the reasoning why hasn't been in anything that I've read or discussed before it's just I know it's a constant topic um, because if I'm remembering past discussions currently I have a duplex that ha and our building has seven rooms it is still a duplex because we own cats and some of our friends are uh, allergic so we have we, we've kept it configured as a duplex. And if I'm understanding correctly, that means for a seven room house, we could have eight unrelated people living there, or you know, however many, uh, it, it could be eight families, which just seems, I don't see that this thing is, that your ordinance is connected to the number of rooms in a house. And I don't know why it isn't connected to that, because that, seem, it's, that seems to be that that would be the problem. Or, I mean, why wouldn't there be something about number of rooms? If it's, a car, if it's something about there's too many cars, if people are unrelated versus a large family of related people, why don't you limit the number of cars per acreage or frontage? So I was just wondering what the, if when you're talking, you could point out why. That was it. Okay, thanks for your input. Any questions? Well, I was gonna, just gonna point out, uh, have you had a, the, the the current city ordinance is uh, buried in the zoning ordinance, actually, in some of the definitions of, f of, of family and how many people can live in a house. There is an existing ordinance, but it's in the zoning ordinance, not in the regular city zoning, or not in the regular city ordinances. Okay, well, so I don't and know what the, why the yeah, zoning is that way. Yeah, and, and uh, that'll probably so come I'm out. So I'm curious. Yeah, okay, okay. So we'll bring it up in the discussion. Okay, thank thank you. you. Any other members of the public who would like to speak before the committee at the beginning of the meeting? Okay. 
any input from the committee members this evening? Okay. Next, we go to number five. This is ordinance number 2005-09-136. This is an ordinance annexing certain territory to the city of Urbana. This refers to a tract of land contiguous to the northwest corner of the city limits adjacent to the Canadian National Railway um, on behalf of Amosa Code Incorporated. I believe we have a staff report from community development. We just we just had UPD put up, so that was the concern is whether or not we were um, broadcasting over cable. We'll hear from Paul Lindell. Okay. First of all, I'd like to say that there was an error on my part in the. Your mic is not on. Excuse me. Can't hear you. Can't hear. You? Okay. It's on. on. It Speak is on. more directly. On. Okay. Yeah. You're a soft-spoken person. That's <laughs> the problem, I think. Okay. Um, the way these cases work, there is an annexation agreement, um, which is the first case, and then there's an annexation petition. Ordinarily, the annexation agreement would be heard uh, by the council prior to the case regarding the annexation petition being enacted. Um, in this case, uh, because of an error on my part in noticing, we ha have gotten out of sequence, and what we're here today hearing about is the annexation petition um, prior to a complete explanation of the annexation agreement. This case will um, come back to the city council at a uh, special hearing. Um, I believe it's going to be before the council or before the committee of the whole on September the 26th. Um, if you would like me to, I can continue with this and uh, explain the petition um, that we have here. Um, but uh, staff would uh, recommend that you table complete discussion of it until uh, September the 26th, um, after you've heard the complete explanation of the annexation agreement with the associated special use permit. Um, it's that's up to you. I so move that we uh, table this until our committee meeting on September 26th. I would second that. We have a motion and a second. Um, motion from Lynn, second by Dennis. Uh, wait just a moment. Libby, would you give input? Actually, what we're asking to happen is for, and there are five or six items that need to take place, including annexation agreement, annexation, special use permit, and a subdivision. Those will all come back to you at a special meeting to be held before the committee meeting on the 26th. It's a special council meeting. This item appears before committee first because it didn't pass go at the plan commission. So probably the proper motion would be to forward it to the special council meeting on the 26th and you might forward it without a recommendation at this point since you haven't had the benefit of reviewing the annexation agreement. I would accept that wording as a friendly amendment. Okay. So the motion really is is that uh, I move to uh, post to forward this to the special council meeting to be held September 26th without recommendation from the committee of the whole. And I would second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. A quick question in terms of process, um, Dr. Tyler, is it? Do you do you want us to reserve questions at that time at this time as well because the questions will be answered later? Or would it be useful for you to at least gather the questions, even if you don't necessarily have answers to them? I think time? questions would be great, especially you know if you've been able to follow the plan commission items. And also this evening, we do have um, two members in the audience who can answer some of the questions, um, one of whom won't be able to be here on the 26th. Mr. Byers won't, and he, he does operate the Amosa Coat um, business. So if you have any questions that he might be able to answer, Mr. Green is also here as well. Okay, so if so, perhaps a way to proceed with the committee is we could ask questions at this time, then we can vote on the motion. So those who have brought questions, we can at least address them when we have um, members present. Do the committee members have questions on this case? I think he's got to pres present information. What's that? I think he's got some information to present. Oh, did you want to give a presentation? Oh, I, d I just wanted to, to mention that um, Mr. Byers is the general manager at uh, Mills Code. So if you do have questions about the operations that they conducted uh, currently at their location on University Avenue um, or, and the, or a question about the particular operations that they anticipate moving to the new location, um, now would be a good time for that. Okay. 
questions then from committee members? We've all read the memo. Okay. Okay. Charlie. Um, what's going to happen long term at the University Street Avenue offices? Will that completely get closed down, redeveloped? Um, what's the long term prospect for that piece of property, I guess? Uh, my name is Rick Byers, and I am the manager for Molesco. Uh We're now currently operating at 705 East University, uh, directly behind the mass transit facility. Uh, the long term plan would be at this time we're going to move. Uh, the hot oils and some of our cutbacks. What we are is an asphalt manufacturing facility. I'm not sure how many of you know that or what we even do there at the plant. Uh, we will probably be moving 60% of our work if we get the uh, permitting to the uh, North Lincoln facility or Sling Court. Uh, we will keep the emulsion facility currently where we're located now. That's about one third of our business. It is uh, not the hot oil uh, per se. Uh, it's a manufacturing of an asphalt emulsion, which is 30% water, so it's a cooler temperature. Uh, it does have less uh, odor than the uh, uh, the hot oils that we're using. We're making about 20 different products right now. We'll probably be moving uh, at least 10 to 10 to 12 of those products to the other facility. There is no long-term plans for the facility right now. Uh, we are we are worried about our rail facility. There's one of the things we're worried about. I don't know how many of you know, but uh, we're at the end of the rail other than Solo Cup. Uh, there has been some discussion uh, earlier years that they might be abandoning that track, which would probably be good for your city if they did for going through downtown. But uh, at this time, we're a little bit concerned about that. I don't know how many of you are aware that there was odor issues about 10, 12 years ago. We have put uh, several scrubbers into that plant since then. Uh, Part of those odors will be gone. Uh, a lot of the truck traffic will be moved out to uh, Lincoln Avenue. Uh, the uh, plans would be we cannot afford right now at this time to move the complete f facility unless you can come up with additional capital to help us move. We'd be glad to accept that from you. Uh, we do not foresee that. So, As of right now, uh, we have no plans to move the rest of the plant at this particular time. So uh, will you actually be expanding and creating more jobs with this possibly or? There will be a few more jobs, but really uh, we're just moving part of the, uh, the operation uh -huh. to a different facility. And, and in terms of moving, will you actually relocate some of the tanks and whatnot as well? We're building new storage all, out there. All new stuff. We'll be building uh, four new storage tanks. Uh -huh. And so what happens to the old stuff that you don't need anymore? We're going to just still be using a big part of that oh, material, okay. but it will be a scaled down version. Uh -huh. okay. We'll use part of that, but it will not be for the uh, our truck traffic will be the major thing that we're uh, taking away from this facility. Uh, and and a lot of the odor then to the or the hot odors. A lot of that uh, we would like to be moving the cut back and the hot oil part of the mm -hmm. the operation out to the other facility. Okay, I I guess my other question is more related to the railroad because I'm a little concerned about you know if if you're you know if you quit having stuff delivered there then. That leaves just solo cup at the very end, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what impact. We're not planning completely until they shut us off. Uh -huh. We will still be using that rail. The somewhat. rail until okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but you will be cutting some we're of your then. We will be yeah. downsizing. Downsizing, and so I'm a little worried about what the impact is on solo cup if they're dependent on on the railroad as well. And I don't know if if uh, Dr. Tyler knows the answer to that or. Or uh, or what? Uh, I, We're not sure how many cars. We've never heard how many cars uh, they actually use over at Solo a year. Uh, we do not see that many cars going past our facility, uh -huh. so we can't answer that. Uh, we're we're concerned that they're going to show us off because they don't use enough. Right. Okay. And there was a question at some time on Vine Street, the overpass, be have to be reconstructed. Uh -huh. uh, we don't know where that developed or what happened to that particular construction project. But uh, if that was ever to happen. For, we use probably a 400 rail car a year at our uh, facility right now. Uh, that's not a lot in railroad standards. And we cannot see a major reconstruction project just for 400 cars. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, Paul, just to understand this, so there's a, another piece of this that has to come in first, or has the plan commission, I saw the plan commission notes. I, I thought they sent it on to council. 
Um, they did. The annexation agreement uh, involves a special use permit um, for the location of their facility on the track that's going to be annexed. Um, it also involves the rezoning of that tract or the offer for the city to um, rezone it upon annexation from county agriculture to city industrial. Um, that went before the plan commission because there was a rezoning involved. Uh, ordinarily, for the council would hear the case for the annexation agreement first, and then the petition to actually annex um, would reference the annexation agreement. Okay. In this case, we're out of sequence, so here today you would be um, hearing about the petition itself without having heard a complete discussion of the annexation agreement. Um, if you would like, we can. Uh, I can give you some explanations of the territory that's going to be involved and uh, a little bit about um, the well, a little bit about the special use itself and the special use uh, on the adjacent property. Some of the background for it. Uh, is that something that's going to be coming in a memo for the 26? Is that essentially the materials you're yes. putting for? Okay. okay. I guess well, it's in the it's in the plan commission. Mm -hmm. I'm confused here because I read the plan commission stuff, so I've read all mm -hmm. the material, I think. Okay. And so I, I don't know which parts which here now. Um, pretty much the entire story is in the annexation uh, is in the plan commission annexation agreement okay. memo. Okay. Well, perhaps what we could do is take questions based on the material we received today, and then. All of the council members have received the plan commission minutes, and we have till the 26th to review those. So you can go ahead and review them. Other questions on this case at this time? We do have a motion to send this to council without recommendation for the 26th. If there are no further questions, if there's no further question, I would like to make one other comment. Oh, it's ahead. just not. It's just not the rail facility is why we're wanting to move, uh, or at least shift part of the operations. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our location, but we're very close to residential area mm -hmm. right there. Uh, the new area that we're looking at is zoned industrial. Uh, there was a question about the special use. It would be very hard to put every every reason to have a industrial facility without having a special use. I mean, we are we're not doing anything out there, uh, dust or anything. We're doing the same things we are right now. We're blending asphalt is what we're doing. It'll be a very clean operation. Our issue has always been the uh, odor. We feel out there that we're sitting right in a perfect location to, to do that. Uh, uh, we're by a recycling center. We're by an aggregate recycling center. We're uh, by a hot mix plant already. Uh, we're by a concrete plant, UPS, a scrap yard, uh, a waste transfer station right next to us. We might be the uh, premium uh, industrial uh, firm out there. but. Uh, I would also make it uh, uh, an opening to all of you if you want to see what kind of facility we're running, where you can come to 705 East University right now if you just let us know ahead of time so I make sure I'm there. But you can see what uh, what the facility would be like. Uh, it's basically storage tanks is all it is. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the fifth and sixth, people in the fifth and sixth wards will be, will be happy to see you move to a better location. Mm -hmm. I do think it's an appropriate move. Um, and my only concern, and I'm sure it'll be addressed in the special use per permit process, is the effect of that the new location on water quality since you're close to the saline. So to just be make, make sure that there isn't any runoff issues there. One thing that I wanted to, to mention, uh, Leader Bonnaby, was that the reason for the special use permit is not because we think the particular activities that they are engaged in are dangerous or use more chemicals or are unusual in any real fashion. Uh, in the industrial zoning district, um, in our zoning use table, we have a list of a number of different appropriate industrial uses, and pretty much all of them are permitted by right. Uh, we have a catch-all um, category called all other industrial uses. And because it's not really possible to describe every single industrial use, um, we throw ones we can't describe into that category. And under that category, they're reviewed under a special use permit process. Uh, generally, anything that is, that is reviewed under a special use process um, you know, it, it's it's open for interpretation on that. We would take a look at access, parking, uh, potentially stormwater runoff, um, 
the complete gamut of, of items, you know, what impact it might have on the neighbors, um, light pollution, anything like that. But again, it's in that category, not because we think it's going to have a greater impact, but because we simply can't describe every single use. Okay. I would like to mention also that we are very uh, strictly uh, regulated by the EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, air quality uh, runoff, we do have to have uh, spill prevention plans and our complete property around surrounding our tanks will be bermed to keep any spill or anything on our property at that location there. We're quite aware of what potential, uh, but asphalt really uh, sets up the second it starts cooling. Uh, at air temperatures it starts set, setting up so there would be uh, very few problems, but we are very well regulated, let me assure you. Okay, Dennis. Um, I did attend the uh, uh, the Planning Commission meeting that you explained your prog program and your plans um, to the public at that time and the Commission. And uh, um, you already own uh, the Track A, which is along the um, railroad, is that correct? Excuse me. You, you, you own at this time the Track A, which is the long yes. strip alongside the, the railroad line. And, yes. part, and part of your intent would be to purchase Lot 204 and combine those two properties to Correct. accommodate the new facility, right? Correct. And um, are there uh, situations or contingencies concerning the um, um, outcome of uh, your um, um, successful um, request for annexation that would have anything to do with the uh, plans that you have out there? What I'm asking is, um, is this, is this uh, at this time, your your uh, plans for moving the the site of uh, the hot oil process to the north industrial site is somewhat contingent upon um, the annexation of Tract A into the city. Yes, uh, what, what we plan to do with Tract A right now, uh, which. I don't know how we can talk to you about Track A if you don't know what Track A is up here. But actually, what it is, uh, it's a uh, we're putting a rail spur in right next to the uh, railroad uh, switchyard up there, and it's a long, uh, probably 600 feet by maybe a half a mile piece of property. And the only part, only plans we have for that right now, are to put a rail spur in there, a double rail spur, on the west side of that property. And this Track 204 sits to the uh, East of that of that facility. I mean, it's very hard to explain to you if you can't see what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, Mr. Roberts yeah. knows. <coughs> oh, they do all that. Oh, okay. There's a location map uh, marked as Exhibit A. I'm Jim Green. I'm the lawyer for Mosico. Um, but uh, the to answer Mr. to answer the Alderman Roberts' question, uh, getting all this approved, uh, approved, including the annexation of Tract A special use permit for uh, track A and the special use permit for lot 204 uh, we need all that done in order to follow through on a land exchange agreement because a Mosa code is only a contract purchaser for lot 204 at this time with uh, MACC of Illinois uh, MACC owns land south of there and they'll get the uh, that strip of land next to the railroad south of track A and uh, this will have major implications for transportation efficiency for both the Mosa code and MACC and it'll move everything over towards you know, away from Lincoln over closer to the tracks but uh, the, I, I grew up around here what amazed me is how far north the operation will be of Interstate 74 I thought it would just be a quarter of a mile it's probably more like three quarters of a mile and you know right now uh, there's a lot of truck traffic around five points headed over towards Amosa Code on East University Avenue. You'll be able to eliminate 60% of that, and the, uh, the, the, a lot of these trucks will be using Interstate 74, exiting at Lincoln Avenue, going north, and that's all pretty much industrial up there. Uh, it's certainly not uh, residential, uh, city type of residential. And then uh, Lincoln Avenue. You take that north to Saline and <clears throat> turn left and go down about three quarters of a mile to where Amosa Colt's hopeful uh, new operation will take place. And it really mixes in well with 
what you already have up there. I know your comprehensive plan calls for track A to be industrial. And you know, just realistically, you're not going to have light industrial right next to a, a railroad track. So there's really nothing better. There's probably no better place for a MOSA coat than uh, where they're proposing to go. Are there any other questions from the committee at this time? Okay, if not, I'd like to, to move the motion forward. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Thank you for your presence here this evening. Thank we'll you. see you on the 26th. Next, uh, we have a discussion on City Council Goals Draft Number 7. And uh, Charlie, would you like to present on this? Okay, uh, first I'd like to uh, find out if there was any public comment. I know there are people in the audience. Uh, Yes, yeah, so there is there public comment. Folks can also speak at the time of the agenda item. So if there are those in the uh, members of the public who would like to speak to the city council goals, please do so at this time. Okay, if not, we'll hear from Charlie. Yeah, okay, um, I don't know if people want to go step by step. I, I could, you know, basically mention each one uh, and, and we could discuss them or I could, you know, go through all 13 real quickly. Um, talking about them in general. Um, how about how about you because for the for the sake of the public that they haven't actually seen or heard this document before? If you mention the goals and say the three or four points underneath E, then if there's input, if there's additional changes or input that committee members would like to give, we could take that at this time. We have gone through this. This is draft seven, so <laughs> for for those who are who are listening um, out there in the audience. Um, count the committee has looked this over multiple times so we're close to getting consensus on this document you might want to actually just d explain kind of the, the overall framework and then okay. walk through the goals okay uh, the purpose of the goals was to, to sort of lay out a framework for what is essentially a new council and mayor um, what what we had you know what we ran on as platforms what our goals were coming into the council why we're here uh, and it's an attempt to try to find common ground on a number of different topics we think are the priorities in the city over the next four years. Um, hopefully that we can take these goals and use them to create study sessions and generate uh, uh, appropriate uh, legislation um, to, to move forward on a number of different issues. It's uh, somewhat generic in its overall scope I mean there's a, a lot of meat that needs to be put on the bones here this is just a skeletal framework of, of what we'd like to do I think and uh, uh, but we hope that this will let us take a, a rather proactive role in shaping things in the next four years um, it's been a very good start for this group of relatively new people uh, to to uh, find this and hopefully uh, it'll let us work closely with the staff and in, in, in what their goals are in the future. What uh, I think we envision is that uh, staff will take these, look at their own work goals, their own workflow, and see how these mesh and come back to us in the next few months. Uh, it will really be up to the mayor, I think, uh, as, the, as the executive head of, uh, of, of the city to, to uh, make a lot of this stuff happen over time uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, that we can uh, uh, all work together on, on moving forward in fact some of the stuff we've already done so uh, jump in uh, our, our goals and they're roughly sort of sort of prioritized but I'm not sure that you know these are the things that are important to us in general uh, the first one is to promote public safety uh, and it's got three points. Provide public and fire service the level needed for all neighborhoods. Support the mayor in putting together a task force to pursue police review oversight board appropriate for our size of city that is effective, professional, and cost effective. And to establish appropriate ordinances to strengthen the city's ability to maintain safe environments within our neighborhoods. Now I would point out that one of the first things that this council did was uh, to, with uh, the mayor's uh, uh, strong backing, was to to uh, push forward on hiring three additional police officers. So we've already taken a step forward in this regard. Comments, or I'll move on. Comments on this goal point? Lynn, did you have any input that you wanted to give? It can wait till the end. Okay, good. Okay, second item is to strengthen Urbana's economic development program. This has a number of points. Um, file a road. 
uh, we, we'd like to see uh, implement an action plan, extend Florida Avenue, work with the neighborhood and business leaders, stabilize nearby neighborhoods, uh, consider additional safety enhancements, and examine further economic incentives. Uh, pretty, um, um, pretty broad, uh, pretty ambitious. Uh, we'd also like to uh, have more recruitment visits that include the mayor and council members to targeted businesses, general business development along Cunningham Avenue, including beautification, monitor developments on 130, 150, and develop a consensus vision. I know one of the uh, one of the issues there will be to see how Florida Avenue extend extends to uh, to 130. Uh, the next item is to look at Olympian Drive completion over the next several years. I know that's uh, in the long term. Uh, capital improvement plan uh, and uh, uh, another interesting item is to hire an economic development development director or manager as soon as possible and we'd consider that at a higher level position that answers directly to the mayor and to the chief uh, administrative officer input on the second goal Heather um, when we we're asking um, this is one question I meant to ask and in caucus and I didn't um, when we were talking about hiring an economic development manager um, is that something that we have already like would that in the budget or is that something that yes currently a big, it's a vacant position oh, okay. so the, the issue has to do with how long it's been vacant for and how we need to hire for that position and I think the other issue has to do with exactly what the structure of that role is. Okay. Currently, the economic development uh, d manager position is uh, under community development, and there's been some discussion about having that person play a role in the executive department. So we're asking for staff to consider a restructuring of that position. and. If they don't agree with that, to come back to us with the reasons, but we want to open up that conversation, and, and we want to get that hired, that person hired as quickly as possible. Okay. The uh, third third point is is uh, probably separated out from economic development, and that's to create an energetic, vibrant downtown that provides needed services to the city. Included here are uh, establishing a downtown commission that will uh, propose a annual action plans uh, to create and implement a redevelopment plan for the Broadway corridor. Uh, to create and implement a redevelopment plan for the Boneyard, particularly from the Race to Vine Street areas, uh, to implement downtown public wireless, uh, develop a trailway from Carl to downtown, uh, increase our you know various outdoor, outdoor activities, um, and uh, and to pursue increased uh, outdoor green space and and possibly the establishment of a public square. So any comments on that particular goal and the items? Okay, fourth item is to preserve neighborhoods and promote rental safety. Uh, in here we have uh, developing conservation districts for historic and sensitive areas of the city. Uh, conservation districts would include such things as review of demolitions, approval of new construction, design guidelines uh, using a design review board or uh, as part of fixed requirements required by zoning ordinance. Uh, increased in code enforcement, particularly for rentals, would be part of this. Uh, we already have a part-time additional housing inspector, and we'd like to uh, uh, pursue that a little further. Another aspect of this would be a rebuild Urbana uh, concept, which would encourage home maintenance, including painting in targeted areas, uh, examining incentives for conversion of rentals and boarding houses to family and condos, and replacing decayed stock to low density or uh, condominiums. Any discussion on that particular point? Dennis. I think that um, maybe just for clarification, when we talk about a conservation district, we're talking also about a preservation district. Are these words synonymous, or are these things different? Well, it's different from a historic district, which has a much higher um, impact on on what the you can and can't do in the right. neighborhood. It's right. a more restricted it's, way of handling. It's, yes, it's, it's a well, less restrictive way of, of handling preservation. And uh, yeah, so you can, whether you call it preservation or, 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 conservation. or conservation, it's probably very similar. And again, a lot of this will, this is a skeletal structure. How it will flesh out, uh, we'll see in the, in the coming years. Any other questions? If not? Item number five is to implement the 2005 comprehensive plan that was passed uh, just recently. Uh, 
has a, a big big item in here, which was which would be to rewrite our zoning ordinance. Uh, we propose hiring an outside consultant in order to accomplish this over the next year, so that we can uh, focus our energies and that of staff on on dealing with billboards and sign issues uh, and other other items that uh, staff is dealing with. A second item would include the use of design guidelines, form-based code concepts, modern sign and lighting standards, traditional neighborhood development standards, commercial big box store standards, neighborhood business zones, uh, preserving historic neighborhoods, farmland, natural areas, and minimizing sprawl as guiding principles. Uh, if you look at the comprehensive plan implementation section, you'll see a complete list of, of action items and goals related to, uh, to this. And uh, the third aspect of this is to update our sign ordinance, setting new guidelines for commercial signs along main arteries and traffic corridors des designated for redevelopment or beautification. I would like to establish a timeline for replacement or phasing out of billboards and tall pole signs along designated traffic corridors. I will point out that item C is new language. There was some language about sign ordinances in, in A that was removed. Uh, and, um, and then Dennis uh, pointed out after our last after our discussions on, uh, on, on signs that we, we lost some of the language and, and he proposed this, uh, this item C here as a, uh, a way to get it back into the goals. Questions or comments from committee members? Okay, not. okay uh, number mm -hmm. six is to reduce Urbana's environmental footprint and waste stream uh, to look at expanded recycling. Uh, we'd like to study and implement green building guidelines and incentives, uh, implement recycling of bottles, paper, et cetera, in downtown, and particularly in the light of the local beer, beer distributors uh, termination of bottle recycling. Uh, we'd like to target construction debris for waste reduction recycling since it's the greatest source of waste, and we'd like to continue supporting hazardous waste collection. Any comments? Yeah, just when you, you kind of overlooked energy conservation. Uh, I think that would be part of green building guidelines, wouldn't it? Yeah. What I'm thinking about is like uh, street lights with the, uh, solar panels, those kinds of things that would really offset the cost of energy for people in the community. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Would that you think that would be in the green? Uh, that would be build. Yeah, that's a little. That that would take a little bit of additional language. I think um, you could say something like, um, in here, study and implement green building guidelines and incentives, as well as uh, other energy conservation uh, improvements. I see a lot of nodding heads. That's fine. Okay, so sure. for so, applications. Uh, so we have study and implement green building guidelines and incentives, as well as uh, improved um, energy saving con as well as other energy conservation improvements as well as other Brendan you had a comment Go ahead. yeah another suggestion for language would be maybe enter, uh, environmentally friendly public works because I know you're specifically talking about the things the city owns mm -hmm. and there's been lots of discussions of you know using less fertilizer or different sorts of plantings or buildings and energy efficiency. So I think environmentally friendly public works mm -hmm. is perhaps broad enough for all of those. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, so how would, would... As well as environmentally friendly public works, we would strike the okay. other energy conservation improvements and do environmentally friendly public works. I think you could leave both. Both? Yeah. Okay, so study... Because you want, you want other things besides buildings. Mm -hmm. Study and implement green building guidelines, incentives, energy conservation improvements, and environmentally friendly public works. Mm -hmm. You've got the language. Yeah, I'll get it from language. you later. You've got the language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Are there other comments on that section? If not, we'll move on to seven. Okay. Uh, seven is to promote diversity and non discrimination in hiring, contracts, public services, and code enforcement. Comments? Uh, item number eight is to increase affordable housing uh, by developing nationally recognized model neighborhoods that are affordable and use 10% of standard energy uh, consumption. Uh, development of replacement rental housing for Lakeside Terrace, uh, 80 units or more that are affordable to the poorest of the poor as per prior council agreement. 
8C is to continue support for accessible, energy efficient, affordable housing, including an effective mix of rent subsidized housing with home ownership programs. Comments from committee members? We've hashed out a lot of these before in the conversation, so can continue. Item number nine is to get Urbana bicycling. Um, a is to create a bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee and seek bicycle friendly community designation. B, staff and council will implement bike committee recommendations on new and improved routes and regional connections, bike maps, designated routes, signage, improved off-street and on-street bike routes and facilities, increased bicycle parking, as well as creation of bike safety and public education programs. Uh, to take leadership role on developing the regional trail to Danville that would include historic Lincoln sites in Urbana, and to develop a local trail from Carl to downtown and other town greenways and trails. Comments? Okay. Uh, item 10 is to create a public arts program. Uh, a, establish a dedicated revenue stream for public art. Uh, consider a percent for arts approach. B, encourage the preservation and commemoration of local and multicultural traditions and histories. Uh, integrate art into every feasible public works project. Uh, promote functional and streetscape art. Uh, D, create a public art program that represents our community in all its diversities in terms of race, geography, gender, class, sexual orientation, belief system, and so on. Uh, e, provide opportunities for local and national established and emerging artists in Champaign County. And F, to develop a strong public collection of artworks representing diverse communities, artistic styles, and disciplines. Comments, Dennis? It might be useful to um, also um, to create a public art commission so that when these are, uh, when we're making uh, judgments or trying to um, integrate public art into uh, projects, we have a group of knowledgeable people who can give guidance and advice. I'm wondering if that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the in the vision of the of a public arts program that that um, I had an intern work on for nine months in research, that that I'll be bringing forward to this to the council does include a commission. If we want to put it in here, we can. Typically, in communities that have revenue streams for public arts where they're taking proposals and they're responding to the proposals by deciding, uh, choosing different proposals over others. It's typically a public arts commission that does that and that's made up of people who have expertise in the areas of arts and public arts, made, made up of artists primarily and some arts administrators. So if, if you it, feel it it's necessary to include that, we could do, include it, that It here. seems wise and it might be useful as an advisory kind of a well, I, I absolutely agree. The question is whether or not we should put it here. If you think it would be useful, let's do that. So we could add something which is under G, which is to establish a public arts commission to yeah. facilitate the public arts right. program. And of course, all of this is a fluid document. These are um, general goals that we kind of basically um, are striving for. And how specifically each one is applied will certainly be determined by um, a lot of other factors and studies. Mm -hmm. So, so we have uh, G establish a public arts commission as an addition. Other comments? Uh, I got something in email, uh, which uh, is more of a question. Um, uh, are you implying quotas for art in item 10D, which is um, concern there was uh, art is about art, not about uh, particular demographic groups? Well, a lot of people who, <laughs> uh, no, there's not quotas. It's not, it's not quotas. It's typically, it's, it's, it's a downfall of many public art programs historically that a particular group, a particular demographic group is represented above the other demographic groups. So successful public arts programs have done a good job of looking at the, the culture, the history, and the communities of the people that are represented by by this council and making sure that different interests and ideas and perspectives are represented. So that's, that's, it's not only a typical piece of successful public art programs across the nation, but it's oftentimes an overlooked piece. So I think it's an important, it's important to actually, I wish we didn't have to stipulate that specifically, but I think that we do at this point. So, so it does not say that the commission, for example, would not have um, before it that because 15% of 
the people who live in Champaign Urbana are African American, that 15% of the art that's created must be by African Americans about African American issues. That's what I understand as a quota that's not being proposed. Other comments? Okay. Okay. Um, the next three are more city issues. Um, uh, item 11 is to recruit and retain top quality staff uh, by becoming more competitive and developing methods for better retaining staff, identifying immediate changes and long-term goals to attract and retain top-notch employees, including examination of pay scale and advancement through positions, and to employ implement uh, appointment contracts. And we've already begun some of these things. Uh, Mayor. I'd like to suggest that we get input from employees. I'd like to make that be item D. Mm -hmm. Get input from employees on how to improve the city's employment climate. Better input from employees on how, on to, how to improve the city's, city's employment climate. Okay. Heather? Would that be current employees? Yes. Other other additions, questions? Okay. Okay, when well, we're all done, uh, you do. Uh, Type mm -hmm. your notes into mine here. Okay. Okay, item I think 12. I have all of them, so. Yeah. Item 12 is to review city code, uh, compare policy to practice, uh, review code for inequities, and pursue relevant changes as required. Comments? Pretty straightforward. Go ahead. Uh, item 13 is to handle council business efficiently. Uh, Improve council chambers audio. Uh, provide three chairs at public comment table and replace with a better microphone. I'm getting pretty sick of that microphone myself. I don't know about how others feel. Uh, yours doesn't even work, right? Uh, we need to provide a public how-to brochure for public input and making comments as new additions to the conversation. I don't understand the la how, that wording there. As new additions to the conversation. Did I get a typo in there? Or? I probably got the how-to brochure. Oh, and uh, I think it was advice for how to make their comments additions to the conversation rather than repetition. Okay, can you make that so, correction? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Let's to fix this. Okay. Uh, item D is to improve meeting efficiency, and wherever possible, staff time at meetings should be consolidated and ordered with agenda items planned so that a particular staff member is not at every meeting. And uh, finally, uh, f uh, several vacation periods have been set. Uh, for this year, and in the event that a council meeting is needed, it should be scheduled to proceed. The regularly scheduled committee of the whole uh, will uh, will be setting other common uh, attempts will be made to to line up other vacation periods in coming years. So. Okay, input. Lynn, you have something. Um, I'm just wondering, maybe if we want to have a little bit of a discussion tonight about. Um, I, I know the mayor obviously needs to um, champion many of these, as you've said, Charlie, but. Probably, um, you know, there are a couple on here that I'm particularly passionate about, and I bet that's true of all of us. And there's seven of us, and there's um, actually, well, there's 13 with several letters underneath. But um, I didn't know whether or not we would want to kind of point out the ones that we would uh, particularly take on, because if we could kind of divide the work, we might be more likely to get more done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had written a couple of notes here. Was, uh, was it along the lines of letting staff take a look at this and returning in some time, which I, I hope Bruce can comment on here, how much time staff needs to look at this, uh, work with the mayor on it now that it's out, um, and then and then assigning certain council members to each area of interest and such, and and how we plan to track what we're doing as well. You know, we've we've started in on some of these already. Um, three or four of the items have already started, and, and how we how we propose to track them over the next couple of years. It might be that once we kind of um, have an assignment, that we uh, provide a report to the council and to the community about our progress in uh, each of the areas. I think that's a great idea. I also think that it's important to point out that 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 um, I don't think the staff should wait for us or that the mayor should wait for us. I think some of these things are quite specific and they actually involve accelerating things that have been in the works for a while and we're saying these are priorities now. So I don't think, in some cases, I think staff can, can move and they have adequate direction. In other cases, there are more kind of general statements and I think that, that council members can provide additional guidance. Uh, mayor and, and Lynn? Well, I, I know that the staff is gonna wanna take a real close look at this and see if it's going to mean that they have to get more employees, that they can do it with the existing number of people. Mm -hmm. um, 
So. That's then, and then thing Dennis, we'll and we'll hear from Bruce. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, one, one suggestion, uh, which we might impl implement, and can, we don't have to do it tonight, but we can think about, is that, um, say, for example, you know, one that I think you know that I'm all interested in is like item 1C. And I could see um, maybe me being assigned to that with another council member, pair up. We establish some sort of task force that has, um, you know, staff on it, other members of the community, and we develop kind of an action plan that we step through uh, in order to meet that particular goal. And then we could we could report on that action plan, you know, at least quarterly uh, as to where we're at. We could have timelines and and uh, you know be fairly formal and and have a um, uh, a good way I think of communicating with our with the community as well. So just a thought. Mm -hmm. Are you proposing that that we kind of divvy this up this evening, or that not necessarily? Anything? Just discussing some ways to divvy it up, or and we may want to even email a central person, may, maybe the mayor, with regard to our particular interests. Um, okay. You know, I know Brandon, you're very interested in the bicycle bicycling thing, and so maybe you and another council member, or maybe you alone. Uh, sometimes it's kind of good to have two council members, you know, maybe even council members that don't think exactly the same about it. Uh -huh. That way you come together with an idea that is more likely to, mm -hmm. to uh, you know, to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis, you had a hand. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it would be probably useful to uh, work together on certain projects, whether we need to um, be as formal as to say, you know, divide it up very specifically or not. Many of us have probably some interest in several of these different um, topics, um, but uh, um, I do think it is useful to have uh, to set up a situation where we can have indeed an action plan started and have some accountability on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this this document can also uh, have an informal aspect, where as various uh, projects are being developed in the city, uh, in public works and whatever, uh, it could be a reference to go back to to see if during a certain planning stage we can include environmental friendly aspects, uh, bike path uh, accessibility, um, that we're meeting uh, the uh, some of the other um, goals of the comprehensive plan. And so it, it, this can have both a kind of a formal um, structure of uh, accomplishment and uh, it also be an advisory informal document that will support um, city planning in general. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you had a comment and then... Oh, Robert. just a couple comments. So first of all, kudos because I think the council deserves a lot of credit for trying to put all of these ideas together. I know you spent a lot of time on it. I think it's extremely helpful um, for those of us who work at the city to have an idea of the direction, even if it's general at this point, on where the council wants to go. So I think that's very helpful. Um, to managing this, what I, what I see is, uh, of course, that there are there's probably a lot of good information that can be provided by city staff to you in terms of timing and cost and uh, what it takes to get some of these things done. And, you know, I'd like, I'd like to have several weeks to do that, um, put that together. Mayor and I talked about that briefly today, and I, I think, uh, you know, the next several weeks we could probably do that. And I think what can be done then uh, is then you can look at these and say, well, these are ongoing things that we're doing, and these are project-oriented, and now we know all the variables, so let's prioritize some of these because you can't do them all at the same time mm -hmm. except for the ongoing ones. So it seems like a logical step would be once you have all the information and the input from people who do the work or, for example, on the site, what would it cost to farm that out? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and in lieu of doing what else? Mm -hmm. and so those are some of the next decisions that probably have to be made. And maybe some of it, a lot of it can be done simultaneously, but my guess is is that you're going to have to prioritize some of this. Um, but uh, certainly we're here to help you get the job done, and uh, we'll uh, provide additional information to you uh, that will be relevant to making priorities. Okay. Thank you. Robert? I disagree with uh, what Bruce said about the priorities. I want to, you have a lot of things here and a lot of, a lot of people involved, and uh, when you do such a comprehensive type thing, there's a lot of input needed by a lot of people, and then you can start placing specific priorities on what we can get to in a short order, what we can do in short term, what we can do in long term, and when that's set up, then we can hit them. And uh, gang up on it, uh, people get together in groups or whatever. 
But I think that would be the next one with this thing. Any other comments? Well, a lot of these already say that we're going to have a task force or a commission, and I think probably a few more of them will end up with that. We need the input from the public for people who really care about these things. It will be a way of, of getting the job done. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Then I, I think this I kind of want to echo what Bruce said. Just I, This is a great to-do list. You know, I feel like we're, uh, you know, while we don't necessarily agree on every little teeny detail of this, we agree generally on these directions. And then I think it's up to us over the next, you know, three and two-thirds years, you know, to get as much done on this list as we possibly can. Yep. I just wanted to add uh, in response to some of the things Bruce said that that I think this council is looking to, to you and your staff, Mayor and Bruce, um, to tell us you're not being specific enough, give us more information, what do you want to start first, those kinds of things. So I think some of these are kind of general things and some are specific. I, I'd like to be able to, you know, at the end of our terms, be able to kind of mm -hmm. say, well, we've, we've hit Check all of off. these in some way, so we, we're, we're going to need your help in terms of <laughs> organizing it, but I, I think it's, it's doable. Um, there were a few uh, additions tonight. Charlie, will you send that out again to us yeah, what so I, that what we I, can send it out to our constituents? What I was going to propose at this point is a motion to send draft 8 to council for approval. Okay. And draft 8 will be what I'll do afterwards with Danielle, and, and I will email it to everybody and the clerk. So is that a motion? Yes, that was a motion. I second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? That carries, and we'll see that at council. Next, we have. Okay, I've lost my agenda here. Next, we've had. More from me. Uh, ideas on neighborhood preservation. It's it's <coughs> really Smith night. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, um, <laughs> but uh, I've been sitting. I've been. I've been sitting on on preservation ideas. Uh, this, this grew out of a number of meetings that um, I've attended, talking to neighbors, canvassing the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, it, it, one afternoon, I think Brandon and I went out for a two or three hour walk uh, through the neighborhood. And when we were all done, we sat down and I just started writing uh, all the things that we had talked about uh, in that tour uh, and, and from input from various people. And what I what I basically is, is is these are ideas on neighborhood preservation, and this is uh, one of the items on the council goals, and I wanted to to uh, to get something started on this because I've been telling my constituents that I had something in the works uh, that I that I was going to take to council, and uh, and so to f to flush out the the the, the preservation ideas. I have a list of uh, nine implementation items uh, for discussion uh, with some alternative ideas, four of those, um, a number of issues, and some related thoughts and ideas. I can read these. I can let, them, let you read them. Uh, they're posted on my website uh, for the public, which can be found at charliesmythe.org. Uh, I will try to improve the, the readability of that uh, of web page uh, this evening when I get home. Uh, so that it's easy to find. But uh, the, the topics include, uh, you know, tightening up uh, definition of family, the, the issue of uh, conservation districts, uh, what kinds of maintenance are expected in, in neighborhoods, uh, a housekeeping ordinance, um, where some of these things would apply in different parts of the community. Um, some aspects, you know, we already apply some things to certain parts of the city, such as the uh, the restricted parking ordinance in the district and, and uh, in the university district, the campus uh, uh, parking area, uh, which overlaps with a lot of the historic neighborhoods. Um, so there's some suggestions here on on how we could, Im you know, what 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 needs to be implemented as part of neighborhood preservation. Um, there are things that also that feed in here. There's some alternative ideas, such as uh, you know what the cost of on-street parking should be. Uh, should it go up, for example, with additional cars per household, or the type of structure that it is? Um, how many vehicles do we allow, both off-street and on-street, per per uh, per property? Um, 
you know, do we need to regulate the number of un unregulated, unrelated individuals in a rental use unit? Uh, does it need to be tied to size or uh, to the number of bedrooms in the in the uh, uh, in the apartment or a single family? You know, we're seeing a conversion of single family to rentals, and uh, it's an attractive real estate proposition, but it also is having a very negative impact on historic neighborhoods. Um, licensing landlords is a possibility. Um, you know, we license restaurants. Do we need to license uh, uh, landlords? Um, you know, if they receive excessive fines and uh, and so on, um, do they lose their license? That, that's uh, you know, when a restaurant doesn't meet certain health standards, they lose their license, you know, or they get suspended or whatever. Um, that that you know, we are talking about uh, having safe safe rental units. Um, we need to go back and visit exactly what we'd like to see our, our rental inspection program look like in the next year. That'll be something for staff. Now, uh, justification for a number of these things is based on, on, on what seems to be an acceleration of some of the, of the loss of the historic neighborhood. Uh, it sort of leveled out a few years ago. Uh, it was sort of quiet for, the, for five or six years, and in the last four or five years, with the rental market, uh, the real estate market being what it is, we've seen additional housing, additional pressure uh, on, on these historic neighborhoods. Um, we continue to see uh, demolition through neglect, where landlords simply suck everything they can out of a property. Uh, it gets pretty run down, and then the justification is, well, let's just rezone this and put something bigger or whatever in its place. Um, and, and that puts a lot of pressure on the neighborhood as well. Uh, when replacements are done, they're done without design guidelines, and many of them uh, don't fit in with the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Uh, interestingly enough, and, and I, th I think we've seen some recent construction on Green Street that actually does work, so it can be done. Uh, so, um, so we know that uh, new construction can, can be done to match uh, the neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, you know, the quality of, of that replacement um, of the, there was replacement structures are, are of concern to me too. Uh, the biggest impact uh, in these neighborhoods is simply that the infrastructure can't handle uh, the many vehicles, uh, particularly for larger houses. Um, I'm sorry, the infrastructure can't handle the many vehicles that are coming to many of these houses. You know, my driveway is a, only handles two cars, and that's only if I empty the, uh, the garage of all the bicycles and other stuff that's in there. You know, so uh, you know many of these are, are one-car garages, uh, one-car driveways. Uh, these houses were built before cars were before every person in a household had a car. You know, and and it's not just unrelated adults; it's family with with teenage children. I mean, I've got families in my neighborhood that have four or six cars because they have. Uh, themselves and two children or four children and so on so everybody has a car and so whether it's unrelated adults or it's or it's just the people in you know the family that lives there uh, we have more cars per house uh, in this area and uh, it's 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 a uh, this area wasn't designed for that many cars so uh, I have a number of related ideas uh, which are, are added to the bottom of this um, what I propose doing is that this is material for consideration in the preservation, uh, the neighborhood preservation ideas. I'd like to see some of these issues addressed as part of the staff discussion and what staff brings back uh, for how we accomplish neighborhood preservation. I don't have any motions here. These are ideas I'm throwing out. I'd like to get more ideas uh, and uh, um, and start the discussion, but this is this is my thinking on this, uh, and uh, and I wanted to share it with everybody else. So, as I understand it, Charlie, your your goal is to receive input on if some things are more of a priority than others for council members, if they have additional ideas on how to respond with the concern, et cetera. And it, it's my understanding also that, that we're talking, although you've spoken mostly about the neighborhood that you represent, the Ward, Ward 1 in particular, which is probably the most impacted by being so close to the university, that we're, we could also be talking about things that affect the whole city and not just that particular neighborhood. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. There, there, are, there are aspects of this, you know, in terms of, of, of you know, houses being converted to rentals, that happens all over town. Uh, and I know that other council members have seen it in their neighborhoods, maybe not to the same extent as in wards one and four, uh, but it, it happens all over town. 
And uh, so I know Lynn has. So what we'll do is we'll take a queue of, of people and we'll hear input. So we'll hear from Lynn, Brandon, and did you have your hand up, Heather? Uh, okay, that's Lynn okay. And, it's and okay. Brandon for now. Go okay. ahead. Um, just a couple uh, input uh, pieces. Yeah, I was kind of roaming around some of our apartments in southeast Urbana, and I noticed that we some we do have an issue also of the maintenance of pools and playgrounds that are owned by apartment owners, owned by apartment landlords, not the city playgrounds or park district. But um, so I think we need to make a point of saying something about the maintenance of pools and playgrounds um, as well. And then um, with regard to the housekeeping ordinance. That, that addresses things like uh, paint, like house repair, uh, trash, weeds, things like that. Is that what you guys are thinking of when you say the housekeeping ordinance? Just, just we checking. Have, we, have, we have some language out there in the ordinances. Like grass no more than eight inches tall. Right. You know, yeah. uh, this is the kind of thing where staff needs to look at. You know, we, we go back to one of, several, of our, several of our goals mesh here. We have the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. We have... Um, the sign ordinance, we have, um, um, you know, making our, our city code consistent. You know, so there are pieces out there we need to go look at and see how they all mesh. Uh, and maybe, you know, if there's a, a piece here, a piece there, and, and something somewhere else, bring them all together in one place so we can understand how they all work, how it works together. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's clear that, that some parts of the community could use a more aggressive, uh, could use some more aggressive maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandon. Yeah, I was hoping tonight that we could talk about a few of these ideas in particular. And Lynn, since you mentioned the housekeeping ordinance, I was wondering if Dr. Tyler could just briefly describe for us maybe the variety of things that people mean when they say housekeeping ordinance and what what we might be regulating in the future and what we are regulating now under that sort of broad category. Elaine and I were just wondering if you all have a copy of the property maintenance code because that includes a lot of housekeeping type items. Mm -hmm. But there's also in our municipal code items dealing with nuisance, landscaping materials, and in zoning we deal with some parking issues and the occupancy. So I think those are the places to look. And the property maintenance code is what the housing inspector uses, and it's part of the um, BOCA series, and we'll be going to the international series, which also has property maintenance. It's pretty encompassing. Um, it does look at exterior paint. Um, it looks at blighted properties. Uh, the level of application can be stepped up depending on number of inspections and uh, number of inspectors. Currently we do systematic inspections only of rental property of um, three units and above. So over so many years and by a complaint, all of these units will be looked at exterior and interior, including pools and playgrounds. And then we have a number of properties that are inspected more regularly because they're um, university Certified housing, for example, mobile homes, um, uh, rooming houses, things of that nature. So we do have quite a bit in the way of housekeeping, and it may just be a matter of summarizing and finding those documents in one place for you. Uh, when you look at the national and, uh, and VOCA in terms of building sizes, room sizes, there's a um, specific criteria, I understand, when, when you talk about what is a family, how many people can occupy given space, and that criteria is given when the buildings are designed. And if it's not incorporated in the ordinances, then they, they fall short. Is that correct? Well, they are reviewed from a code perspective, also a fire occupancy perspective. We can set um, more restrictive guidelines. So we look at occupancy from a building standpoint, and that might be egress in the case of a fire. But also in the zoning ordinance, we look at it in terms of what use categories are, zoning use, not building code use. So for single family, uh, actually dwelling units have the definition that um, Charlie was talking about with the family group plus no more than three other unrelated individuals. That's a definition not of a family, but of single family dwelling. Right. So. so Dr. Tyler, part of 
and part of what we see in the neighborhood is that landlords are able to buy a house that was a single family house, begin renting it out, and stop maintaining it and and sort of engage in demolition through neglect. I think that's a wonderful phrase for it where you know they plan to not maintain the house over the course of thirty years but to rent it out every year and wait for it to to slowly run down at which point you know clearly the thing to do is demolish it and then build something else there like an apartment building try to you know try to get something bigger on the lot and so it seems that the housekeeping ordinances you know, I know that's a broad category that we have now aren't aren't stopping some landlords at least from the demolition through neglect program I and I wonder if you have ideas about what particular gaps there are or what particular things we could, by doing more inspections, um, stop from happening? I think one of the best controls is the zoning, and there was a lot of down zoning that was set in the downtown to campus plan. So I think that prevents the demolition by neglect in the hopes of rebuilding something more profitable. That limits that. Um, there's been talk about how can we provide incentives to improve this maintenance when you're in a very high value area such as West Urbana that becomes very difficult where it doesn't meet the target area re requirements say for HUD. Um, some other suggestions to step up um, rental inspections. We do respond to complaints and if you had truly a bad locations chances are there would be complaints, there would be parking violations, there would be noise violations, garbage violations, nuisance violations. We would have been there and been dealing with these people quite a bit, could be over occupancy. If we step up our rental um, through funding mechanism for increased systematic, we could probably attend to these properties more frequently. And actually that gets me to one of my other questions tonight, which is, I know there's been discussion of bringing on a full-time inspector in the budget and this last year we, we added a half-time inspector to begin the process of doing more inspections. I'm wondering what what's your description of the sort of the next level of systematic inspections and of a full-time inspector and the program that we could accomplish with, with that human resource here? I think it, it would be effective. Um, and hopefully we can find a funding mechanism that's tied to that resource in our community to have um, an additional housing inspector. We do have many thousand units of multifamily and more and more each year. So it would reason that you would want to add um, personnel power to doing that. I think it's a very effective program. I think we get compliance, um, very hardworking housing inspector. If we had two, I think we would accomplish twice as much and a couple, well, a rental registration program or apartment licensing program is one way to fund such personnel through user fees, essentially. And because we have so many thousands of units, it would not need to be an onerous type of fee. That's something we're beginning to examine, and we have a survey that we'd like to send out to other communities to see what their fees are and how it's worked and any suggestions. Dennison. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and when there's non-compliance, when an inspector finds a problem with the maintenance of a property or, or something serious that could impact the residents, like, you know, the heat doesn't work or the running water's unavailable or something, are there sort of increasing <coughs> violations with, with the number of times there's a problem or are there increasing fines? So that, you know, if a landlord has a problem once, then there may be a small fine, but if there are repeated problems or if a landlord causes inspectors to come back to a certain property more than normal because of problems there, is there an escalating fine structure for that? To my knowledge, we don't have repeat offender escalation. Well, actually, we did in zoning, but for, we just added that. But for um, property maintenance, if there are a lot of counts, we count all the violations, you know, they're each counted separately, and if we assess fines, they're per violation per day. So that kind of activity gets noticed pretty quickly. In terms of egregious violations, no running water, no heat, that gets taken care of immediately, and then um, there's a rent deduct that we can assess or we can lien the property. We have ways to 
respond more quickly in those cases. We can condemn if necessary. We can and do that and um, provide accommodations for the impacted parties. And so we have different levels of remedy. Okay, thanks. The Dennis and then Laurel. I know that, that we're not solving this problem tonight, but um, and I, I recall that uh, the previous councils put a quite rather intense energy on some of these questions as well um, and had come up with some uh, useful suggestions that were uh, hadn't really gotten into the point of being debated before um, for various reasons that they were put on hold. Um, about a month ago or so when there was a neighborhood meeting and um, uh, the mayor and I were there and we were, they were talking about um, neighborhood safety in the uh, South uh, Learman Avenue area. Um, I talked with uh, Edward Bland Jr. and he's the executive director of the housing authority for Champaign County and he had some very thoughtful comments about um, uh, landlord and uh, rental unit registration and he had a lot of uh, experience working with cities that had successful programs and I would suggest talking with him. He said that for a fee of about twenty dollars they were able to fund about three or four full-time uh, um, staff people who, who were um, whose sole job was to uh, evaluate and um, uh, inspect uh, rental units. So it seemed to me that it was a very viable way of um, uh, paying for a fairly uh, large increase in staff through, as you're saying, um, participant um, small fees and participant uh, landlord um, projects. So there's probably some really good ways of uh, accomplishing some of these goals. And I know the East Urbana neighborhood has smaller problems than the West Urbana neighborhood, but has still um, areas uh, where uh, you can see the homes are uh, beginning to deteriorate and need assistance. And there are a lot of uh, rental units on the east side of town as well. And I'm sure that um, some project um, is very, we really, the, the council should, should try to accomplish some kind of a goal in this area. Mayor. Do we have the halftime building inspector now? We're accepting applications. It's been um, noticed in the paper. So that's a beginning that will help. And at least part of this person's time will be um, focused in our target area and with our um, affordable housing program inspections. But that will help free up some of our regular housing inspectors' time. Thank you. Other comments? Brandon. I had one other sort of line of questioning or possibility here that, that I want to learn more about is ways to regulate parking. I know, you know as I, I looked back tonight through the documents that the WUNA Neighborhood Association put together on things that are typical of university neighborhoods and what can be done. And the the three things that jump out the most are from their document are party houses and the impacts of party houses on the neighborhood, the decrease in green space and increase in traffic that these neighborhoods bring, and the deterioration of, of homes, of the buildings themselves. And parking is one that I hear very often I wonder what you know, Dr. Tyler, about things that other cities do or, or that we do and could be doing differently to limit the amount of pavement and parking on a single family lot. And yeah, yes, that's question one. It's, it's actually kind of a complicated issue for a zoning ordinance and we've tried to do some reconnaissance and looked at air, um, historic aerial photos and debated ways to improve what our regulations are because um, sometimes the visual effect is not really what's desired. Like one of the problems is that we may have something that looks like a single family home but is actually a rooming house and had gravel in their yard some time ago. Those are legally permitted currently unless it can be proven that there was no gravel. Um, one thing that I think the zoning ordinance might do well or could be the question is there there is um, an allowance if it's a single or two family house to have up to an additional two spaces added. And we also allow um, dust free type of gravel 
for single and two family and if you look throughout the city not just west urbana you'll see that people take advantage of this provision and it's probably because it's cost effective for them so say you have a large family with four or five vehicles you can um, as long as you meet certain width requirements you can create up to two additional parking spaces so you might have a large family you might have a boat in the garage I, motorcycles who knows we do allow that and I've seen that a lot of people have taken advantage of that and it doesn't necessarily need to look bad what does look bad are those um through time where the gravel is not maintained or where it's not really a single family or duplex use it's there's many people living there many adults a lot of vehicles historic gravel lot or even paved lot in the back and then we, we lose that lawn area and the open space one remedy would be to take a look at some of these liberal provisions in the zoning ordinance and you know, cut back on those knowing that that might impact um, single-family homes and, and people who have been using those where it's not a commercial operation another is to look at our open space ratio and reevaluate how that's measured um, perhaps look at requiring some green space all around the house or something of that nature tweaking up the the percentage um, we could look at landscape materials that are used so I think there's ways that we can still make it easy to park your vehicles off the street um, if you're a single family home or a duplex but without creating these rental um, properties that are just have cars in the backyards those are don't look very good I have a quick follow-up question just on the topic um, when I think about this issue I think about restaurants a lot so I can cook food at my house and I can feed it to people I can invite all of you over to my house and as long as we don't talk about council business you can come over and eat my food and it doesn't have to be a certified kitchen if I'm a business I have higher thresholds I I actually have a responsibility to the public is much higher threshold than I do as an individual person where I will be accountable to whether or not there's salmonella or whatever in my eggs and I'm feeding that to my guests so similarly when I think about the rental situation I feel like a key component is actually separating off people the owner occupied situations the, the folks who who are living someplace from a business and with a business there needs to be a level of accountability because someone is, does not live there in terms of safety in terms of um, these kinds of these kinds of issues but particularly the it comes down to the safety issues so when you when you say things like well we could cut back on liberal provisions in the zoning ordinance but it would affect potentially affect um, uh, single-family homes I think why is it not the case that we can well, why can't we separate the uh, businesses from from homes functionally and why is it that we can't then say here's a business if you're operating a business you need a license you need a license per unit it's gonna be ten bucks a unit or whatever it is something something that's decent you and and you need to fund us coming in and inspecting the business to make sure that um, people who rent here are safe because because you're operating a business and so safety is an issue in a way that it isn't necessarily the same kind of need, needing the same kind of uh, government oversight as it is with the owner occupied so I guess I, I keep coming back to that as a solution and I, I am curious about your thoughts well I, I think it's similar um, the rental registration program would be because these are commercial operations and should help to fund for the staff to make sure they're safe so there's a, a responsibility there so that's one side of the equation that this is pretty um, pretty major commercial enterprise in the city of Urbana and we should have different standards because of that and we do actually we do mm -hmm. our systematic inspections on rental for that very reason and there's different code requirements the um, as we seek to regulate better where these commercial enterprises exist in our residential neighborhoods we just need to be careful not to make it harder for you know regular Joe homeowner to have a less expensive paving material for example or the ability to have an extra space to put their 
second vehicle. And I, I just the observation is that these are probably um, valued provisions for our homeowners. Then if we want to get into, well, this is a single family home that happens to be rented, we, might, we may have an enforcement problem when it comes to zoning. So we can apply um, systematic inspection when it's rental. Can we have a different standard for a rental single family versus owner occupied single family when it comes to a parking space? I'm not so sure about that. And that's because sometimes houses go from rental to to own to rental. Right. And so here you have this physical characteristic of a property and it has to change if it becomes a rental. That makes sense to me on some level that in, and the in terms apartment of the and is different. That is more of a commercial enterprise and that's why we don't allow apartments or rooming houses or things of this nature to park in the front and side yard. Mm -hmm. If they're going to provide the parking that's required, it needs to be in a bona fide parking lot. It can't be with gravel. It has to have drainage. It has to meet the setbacks. It has to have screening, all those things. So there's no in between. The reason we see in between is because of grandfathered provisions and just the difficulty in finding out when was this gravel laid down. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there are ways we can improve the situation. It may be that we, we say, well, this grandfathered gravel is no more, <laughs> no more, you know, 70, 1973 gravel mm -hmm. for um, three units and above, whatever the, the uh, cutoff is, that's sayonara, and then maybe we're going to see more pavement. But. Well, I have one uh, thought. I think a lot of this is happening in, uh, in traditional older homes and older communities, and where there, where there was not a provision for automobiles around the house. Additionally, there was not a whole lot of provision made for automobiles on the street. Um, have you thought about the possibility of one-way streets and increasing the parking on the street? Uh, for example, in Baltimore, that's a big issue, mm -hmm. and uh, they don't—they have a single driveway <laughs> for the old Model T strips, you know, and they go one-way streets and they have parking on both sides. But they, it's very congested unless you can increase the street size of every community. But it is a solution to a parking problem. You can think about that. Yeah. We have pretty narrow widths, but there may be some streets where that would help. I mean, that's just a possibility, the increase the, the parking in the area, keep them off the grass and on the other inputs. I have a couple of things. Um, I, I Charlie's asking for feedback, and I, you know, we we share the same neighborhood in many ways, and I'm I'm uh, very interested in working on these issues with you. A couple of things. Um, I keep hearing the issue of impact. That that the issue of over occupancy is impact. We, the council tightened up our over occupancy limits earlier this year, and I feel like we did that. It probably had some positive consequences, probably not. It didn't solve everything. So the issue is, why do we come back for, to that issue instead of looking at the impacts issue? And I'd like to propose that in terms of priorities, the things that we focus on are things like limiting the paving ratio on a property, which I think would help. Um, this has been very informative. I didn't know that. Uh, I actually didn't know that apartments had to have parking in the back end. They had to be solid because I've seen so many apartments that didn't have that. I actually didn't even know it was regulation except. So so I think we could cut off the grandfathered. I mean, we could see, you know, make a, make a date by which certain things just can't continue. And I think that would be a, um, a concrete step that we could take to address some of those issues. When, when we talk about impact, we're talking about cars, we're talking about litter, we're talking about noise, we're talking about the impact on um, the, 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 the house kind of uh, demolition through neglect, which Brandon mentioned. And actually, I, you know, most of the people I represent are renters. So speaking from a renter's perspective, renters have major safety issues. I have a friend whose house burnt down this weekend. She's known for a long time. She's lived there for 10 years. She's been a, she was a graduate student here. She stayed. 
Her house is cheap. The only thing she got out of it was her cello. She's not this in the ward that I live in, which is mostly rentals. We have a much higher, much higher um, possibility of fires, and we've seen multiple fires in the ward that I represent, simply because it's a renters ward. I've asked the chief of police to give me data on fires over the last few years, and it is phenomenal how many fires happen in rental areas. That not only impacts our fire department and its services, but it also impacts people's safety, which I think is even more important. And so we have these issues here. So I'd like us, each time we, when we're looking at these issues, to really take, to, to, to hit the safety thing. So I feel like First and foremost, we need to make sure that people aren't dying. That, to me, is like, if you want to talk about priorities, let's talk about making sure that people don't get hurt. Um, people getting hurt means they're being shocked by their light switches. I could mention multiple landlords' names who I won't mention that I rented from where I insisted that they fix the electricity because every time we touched the lighting fixtures, we were shocked never got fixed. To this day, it hasn't been fixed. I still go into these houses. I don't rent anymore, and the lights haven't been fixed. So, so I think looking at the safety issue is important. That's why I think one of the very first things we should focus on is the landlord licensing issue and is increasing our housing inspections. And to make sure not only increasing the number of housing inspectors we have, but get those housing inspectors in the, the, the places that have two units, for example, and three units. I know that that expands significantly the scope of the places that we're looking at, but we're seeing a lot of problems in those areas. So looking at the MOR district that has a lot of R2s and, and up, but specifically R2s and R3s with um, some significant code issues. So that's, that's one thing. The, um, another concern I have in terms of looking at priorities is to do things in ways that do not increase kind of do not create a hostile environment for people and do not um, raise privacy concerns. So there is a history, it's unfortunate, in my neighborhood of people peeking into each other's windows. And they're not peeping toms, they're trying to figure out how many people are in that house. And I understand their concern, I understand the urgency of the issue, and I also think there is a limit to what you should be able to do to your neighbors. Um, and I think that we have been told by our staff that enforcing over-occupancy, we were told this multiple times this last Jan January and February, that enforcing over-occupancy was very difficult for them and that it's, it's elusive. So for example, you have four people living in a house, but you see eight people coming and going. Well, each one of the, the people there have significant others who are coming and going in the house. Those significant others might actually have places to live in, in Urbana, but you, you do have eight cars, you have, do have eight people coming into the space. So how do you figure, do you count beds? Do you start asking, looking for rings? Do you, I mean, once you get into these issues of over occupancy, you start really asking people, well really, are you a family? And there's a kind of invasion of privacy that I think is, is not justified, and it creates an environment and a climate that's really kind of hostile, and I don't think it's something that we want to see in this community. So, so let's deal with the things that we can see. The things that we can see are noise, litter, um, the paving, the number of cars and the, pa and the amount of material that's, that's paved on, on a property. Those are things we don't have to peek in somebody's windows. We don't have to, to start counting beds and asking people to sign um, affidavits saying that they're this kind of respond, they're this kind of relationship or that kind of relationship. I just don't. I, I think that that kind of thing is very invasive. Unfortunately, I feel like um, people who rent oftentimes are students. Students are a basis of our economy here. In fact, none of us would probably be here unless there were students here. The issue is that students are, are underrepresented in many ways in terms of their voices. They don't know who their council members are, they don't come to meetings, they, they don't speak up, they're not heard, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't represent them and that we shouldn't treat them fairly and decently. So it's important that we, uh, in terms of priorities, I think that that should be kind of our litmus test every time we think about things. Just the third thing in terms of litmus test is when we're talking about trying to deal with a particular situation, I know Charlie has a neighbor neighborhood situation where people are saying that they're cousins and it ends up that there's multiple people living in a house because of the cousin, what he's calling the cousin loophole. I think that it's important to look at that issue and make sure as policymakers that we know that we're actually, we're making policy for everyone. So sometimes you try to catch a fish and you like throw this big net and you catch a whole bunch of other things too. And I think we need to avoid 
casting the wide nets that just to get the little fish. So let's make sure that when we do policy, we're looking at all the different circumstances across all the neighborhoods and we know what the consequences are on people. So that's what I have to say at this point. Other pieces of input. Charlie, do you have additional questions for <coughs> committee members? Well, um, the issue is, is I think, I think that we can look at impact and so on, but we have a situation of existing properties and how do we deal with those? Uh, we have houses that have already got paved backyards and they're single family houses. Um, and um, you know, they've got a two car garage and they've got two cars in the garage and three cars in the driveway and five people living in the house and you know, it, there's an impact there. and. Um, we're not going to change the fact, you know, the, the driveway's already paved. It can already hold five or six cars, um, theoretically, uh, plus all the friends that come to visit. Um, so we, we need to come up with something that, that um, we, we need to stri strike at this with multiple, from multiple angles. It can't be just one thing. There is no magic bullet. And so... So that's why there are nine implementation items, and I'm sure there are more that people can think of here. It's not just any one particular thing that's going to solve uh, the issue. You know, conservation districts and setting them up is going to be a, a, a big item. Um, that's one aspect. Uh, dealing with, you know, how much green space, what, what kind of surfaces, that's another one. But that doesn't deal with uh, um, the fact that we've got several houses in the neighborhood with too many people in them, and when you have too many people, you have too many cars. Um, yeah, granted, uh, a, a large family might have six cars in that family, but it only exists for a short period of time while those kids are teenagers. They move out, um, family downsizes, family moves on to another neighborhood, so on. You, you see changes. but So there's a difference between a, an owner-occupied house where you have a large family which changes over time, and a rental unit which always has four or five or six people in it, or in the case of a boarding house, up to 15, and the constant pressure on the neighborhood. And it's, it's that aspect that I'm, all, I'm trying to get after here as well. You know, so there's both what can we do to keep anything more from happening, but what can we do to control what has already happened. Um, you know, it's going to be a very difficult um, process. That I, I can picture this because uh, we have such specific, we have very specific problems that have sort of plagued certain neighborhoods for a long time. And how can we improve the quality of life for all of our inha uh, the inhabitants of Urbana and avoid uh, the onus of micromanagement? I think that a city is already known to be pretty difficult on construction codes and a lot of things. How can we achieve our goals without falling into the trap of trying to micromanage everybody's life? And so it's going to take some thought. And I'm wondering if some of these larger projects that have a fairly deep impact in the way we may be structuring or changing the structure of um, our ordinances, I wonder if it would be useful to uh, get a, uh, a consultant or something who maybe has a depth of experience in handling certain uh, elements of um, code restructuring. I'm just suggesting that, there, it, that some of these uh, programs which we'd like to tackle quickly, I mean, it might be wise to get um, some expert advice and opinion. And so I'm just throwing that out because uh, I'm trying to find a balance of how to really accomplish some of these things and achieve our goals without um, becoming milit the militant micromanagement uh, city of um, central Illinois. So. I'm just, I don't know what the answer on that one is, but Let, let's, let's try to remain balanced as we approach these projects. Um, so, we had, so we get real, some very smart, intelligent solutions. Uh, and like you said, Danielle, uh, we don't want to uh, you know, go into the hostile environment kind of approach to life. So that's our challenge. Okay. I think that normal Illinois does a lot more building inspecting than we do. They have a lot more inspectors. So it might be good just to look around and see if somebody else is doing a good job and what has been the impact. People feel like their lives are being overseen, you know, ridiculously, or is it something that works well? Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
Charlie? I guess one of the things I'm interested in, in hearing from community development is, is um, and it was already touched on, and uh, is the aspect of owner occupied. Um, I was sort of envisioning uh, expanding rental inspection to include one and two unit properties when they're not owner occupied. Um, you know, if, if I own a du you know, if a person owns a duplex and they're living on one side, um, you know, that strikes me as something, you know, owner occupied, we don't really need to deal with it. Though the people who are renting should have some provision to, to ask for an inspection, I think. Uh, but uh, if uh, you have, uh, you know, a prop you know, number of property management companies that go out there and they, they own dozens of homes and they rent them as a business. Um, it, and, and in that kind of a situation, uh, that it strikes me that those single unit rentals need to be inspected. Uh, so uh, that's, that's an area I'd be interested in hearing about. Uh, I'd also like to know what happened to the uh, rental affidavit uh, as ideas that were floating around the council just before this council took over. I know it sort of died uh, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, by some. I know, I know, but uh, 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 it, it had some aspects of, of, of closing the loop on, on dealing with the four unrelated individuals. At least that way we would get, make sure that people found out that they weren't supposed to have more than four unrelated. I mean, so uh, there were some, some good aspects uh, to that program, and uh, I'd sort of like to, I'd like to see that uh, uh, maybe revisited. Just on last comments with the single and two family inspections, I think that just impacts the systematic inspection program. There's probably a good idea to inspect those, and if they were added, we would really slow down. But if we have a rental registration program, not necessarily affidavit, but a licensing type program that could fund that, um, we could conceivably accommodate that. There's many, many properties that fit in that category, so we would want to increase our um, staffing and able to add those. And there is a relationship to the um, affidavit program in that that was facing a very serious challenge from the apartment association at the time that it was um, presented by the last council and um, with some pretty significant basis in trying to pursue rental registration or apartment licensing. That is something that we would really want to enter into with at least some cooperation and knowledge by the apartment association. And so the two goals of the affidavit was really getting at occupancy, monitoring occupancy, um, more than any kind of safety issues or inspection issues. There's inspection just for occupancy and um, just tracking that primarily. That, because um, of many of the issues that were debated at council was also um, seen as problematic very vigorously by the apartment association and even by the, um, uh, they hired lobbyists from Springfield to assess the, the legislation and um, I kind of was able to hear their comments at the last minute I was told that he would be speaking and so I was able to do that. What I think would be beneficial would be to develop a program that would have that cooperation um, move forward, you know, both on occupancy and safety and increased inspections, inspections on, you know, more units and do it in, in such a way that it's mainstream. Um, we do have a list of other places that have rental registration. Normal is one of them and we'll look at others and collect those and would like to do, we from staff would like to do something that's done elsewhere and, you know, defensively and fits within our, our environment here. and previous program it really did not have any staff review or input of any nature and we would love to be able to be participants in the program. Charlie? Uh, I guess that that sort of actually almost brings us to closure in the sense that um, what you're saying is that you'd like to tackle this long list of mine um, <laughs> and uh, come back with some some proposals. Is that what I'm yeah, and I appreciate that there are a lot of thoughts. Some of them we may not be able to do all of them, but I think some we definitely can, and some are right in with the larger goals, and some we've already thought about and have begun work on, so we would like to respond. 
Uh, do you have a possible timeline? I know you, you, there are a lot of a lot of things on on in the goals in general, um, um, but um, I guess uh, I'd like to see this done uh, in my lifetime, uh, or maybe in my in my term would probably be the best uh, the best way to describe it. Um, um, so you know, is there is there uh, I, if you've already started working on it, and I, I, I know there are pieces of this that I've heard mentioned, um, I guess when can we expect something back? I think that it's it's so connected to the larger list of goals because it's the same individual. So we would want to coordinate the responses. So the same folks will be mm -hmm. working on them, and I, I think that would help to come back and look at how it fits with our work plans currently and then come back with some action, some responses, some action items, and then do the work of the prioritizing. Some of these can be handled, you know, multiple goals can be handled with one particular program, for example. So. Well, maybe how long has the city been handing out the um, brochures? We developed this brochure a year, just a little over a year ago. We mailed it out to a very large area in West Urbana to occupants of rental properties. And we did that again last week. And the purpose of this came out of discussions with the University Neighborhood City Group that meets from time to time. Purpose is to just, you know, say welcome to the city. And, you know, by the way, this really is a single family neighborhood. There's a neighborhood group. This is a contact. And then there's a lot of rules too so you know enjoy yourself but you know please abide by these and if you yourself are troubled by um, waste you know garbage cans not brought in by a certain time here's a phone call you can you can call if there's a excessive noise your neighbors are making excessive noise and you know we talk about um, alcohol consumption there's some rules that students don't know about. We want them to be aware of some of those rules. So it's like all those different things. Where how to you know listen, how to access council meetings, city website, the Luna website. Um, it's it's just a lot of good information. We let them know emergency numbers. Um, and you know I'd love to hear any feedback if you hear from anybody if they feel that this was helpful to them or not. Um, just seems like it was an important communication tool to start with. Thank you. Any other comments? Input? If not, it sounds like uh, next steps in terms of this discussion are to hear back from the staff in terms of a work plan that would incorporate some of these ideas um, as part of looking at the larger council goals. Okay. Next we have, actually, I thought that these were two, that we were discussing these two things at the same time. They're different. Okay, so number eight, we have a discussion item, which is kind of a subset of our, our recent discussion. So this is an item from Neighborhood Preservation List on the definition of family for the purposes of regulating the number of unrelated individuals that can live together in certain zoning classifications. Charlie. Okay, this is another item for discussion. This is a specific item that came out of the preservation list that I thought could be tackled early on. Uh, I'm, I'm, again, it would, it's, uh, it strikes, strikes me as something that can be tackled quickly uh, if, um, if it can also be seen as part of the larger goals of, uh, of the previous item. Um, I have looked at a number of, uh, of functional family definitions, and I think uh, in response to the question earlier, um, if uh, Libby would mind just speaking up one more time, uh, if she could just quickly run down uh, where and what the current uh, rules are on for unrelated adults, that would be helpful. We don't have a definition for family and the zoning ordinance, and it's easy to think that the rule is no more than four unrelated adult, you know, adults in any household, but it's a little more complicated than that. Under single family dwelling, is could it's you the, could you give us the, the zoning ordinance reference too, please? I found I'm it looking in Article Two definitions, page thirteen, at the two, bottom. Page thirteen definitions. 
So it defines the unit, not people living there, as a building containing one dwelling unit and occupied at any given time by a group of persons consisting of one or more persons related by blood, adoption, or marriage, living and cooking together as a single housekeeping unit, together with not more than three additional persons not related by blood, adoption, or marriage. So what that means is, okay, in, in my family, two, two boys, husband and wife, and we could have potentially three, and we, we do have an exchange student with us now, but we could have two other exchange students. And of course, there wouldn't be enough space for everybody. But and actually, where this comes into play in terms of over-occupancy is when we have a rental house, a single-family house, and, and that's the use, but it's rental, and it's rented to students, practically speaking, and maybe there are five bedrooms in the house. So there would be Lawfully, there could be four roommates who are unrelated. They're roommates. They're not a family, just roommates. And that fifth roommate becomes a violation of our zoning ordinance. Those are the calls that we get um, for suspected over-occupancy. We'll get a call. Housing inspector will go over there and find, well, a number of things. The fifth person, they'll have to move out. Or oftentimes, at least half the time, it will be, well, that's my friend visiting here. He's on semester break from wherever. That's this roommate's girlfriend or boyfriend, and they actually have their dwelling units over in Champaign. Um, or the one that, that came up last year was, well, we are cousins. And I looked here, and well, cousins are related by blood. And so I asked for proof, and I got letters from their families that they were cousins. and. They were, um, I don't know if this, this is related, but um, the Chinese students, and I know cousins are important in Chinese culture, and I had letters from the parents, and that was, that was the famous, one famous loophole. So I think in defining a single family dwelling unit, we've attached a lot of definitions, but what it doesn't mean is that you could have four family groups all living in a single family home. And then um, I'm trying to think if this comes up in some of the other unit definitions. Multiple family is a building containing three or more dwelling units, each of which is occupied at any given time by a group of persons consisting of one or more persons related by blood, adoption, or marriage, together with not more than three additional persons not related by blood, adoption, or marriage, living and cooking together as a single housekeeping unit. There is the need, and we have some omnibus zoning ordinance corrections we're working on to recognize foster children. And this, the last time we looked at this, we realized that there were some family definitions that we weren't covering. So we don't have a family definition, but we have multiple family and single family dwelling definitions that can sometimes be um, a problem from perspective of neighbors and single family homes being rented. So there's nothing here that would prevent the, the family with the six teenage kids with all their vehicles and, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends coming and going and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a cousin living there for the summer or the exchange student. And then also uh, oftentimes we'll see a smaller family unit that may have extra rooms and they'll rent those out to boarders and they may have more than one boarder. So, what you're telling us is that um, you could have a family that would violate the the uh, design criteria for a house in terms of space. Because you could have as many as twelve people. It is a family story. Yeah, twelve people plus three more. So if you look at yeah. the space, then you've got a life safety issue. We could have crowding. This is not what we get complaints about because there are locations, I'm sure, where there's crowding going on. You know, maybe with some immigrant populations or um, migrant workers, things of this nature. We don't get those complaints because we don't have single family homes next door. And it's presumably um, 
beneficial because it's affordable to the people who are in those crowded conditions. But that's a safety concern, and that's where we would want to be doing our inspections and, and making sure that we weren't well, getting what those. They, what if they were a family but violating the space? Then what do you do? You know, we have not, I have not come across that, how we deal with that. follow-up question which is how many calls do you get to owner occupied homes about over occupancy violations is is that is that on the radar at all as a concern or is it is it almost always a, a total business use property total <coughs> rental is, how many complaints do we get on yeah, I mean, over in, terms occupancy? Of, in terms of trying to identify what the problem is I'm going kind of going back to my like someone living in a house versus someone owning a house as an income property mm -hmm. is the pro is there are there any you know is there any other than the occasional instance of a problem with an owner occupied house and over uh, owner occupied house being over occupied and calls being made to that house we get complaints in six or seven last year um, about over occupied rental single family homes. We don't get complaints about multifamily units by and large. I think there was there was one perhaps last year that was an apartment that we got a suspected over occupancy on. Otherwise they tend to be the single family homes. But they're not owner occupied single family homes. Right. Okay. And I think one of the weak links here is having those six bedroom older homes that are rented because it's just so hard not to rent out, you know, not to have another roommate to split the rent. It, it's beneficial to the occupants, to the landlord, and it's, it's compelling. But those are, those are the problematic cases. Those are the ones that semester after semester, they're over-occupied, it's hard to prove, people get exasperated, they give up complaining, and that's what Charlie hears a lot about, and I know Esther did quite a bit too. What what is, what is your kind of front burner solution to that exact problem that you're describing? What do you think? What's your recommendation in terms of what we should pursue? I think improved awareness would be good. This brochure talks about um, occupancy limits. I think if people would please not be exasperated and call us because it's you know it's no good having these rules if people don't assist us in enforcing them. I think um, the systematic inspections down to single and two unit rentals would obviously help. Um, I think all of these things combined. I think the, um, the testifying is just so changeable who's living there. That would be a huge endeavor to have the affidavits exactly on who's living there, what the relationship is. It, becomes a whole endeavor unto itself. But if we can be proactive about it, we did last year increase the fines um, for this type of zoning violation. We increased fines for repeat offenders and we made it unlawful to offer a property in such a way as to encourage over occupancy. That's something that we never had before. And I think that really woke people up. That plus the um, proposed affidavit program, we had a lot of calls, worried calls from people who wanted to know, am I doing this correctly? And the implication being, well, I'm worried now I might have been playing around the edges before, but I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I think we might have had some effect, and we'll see this year how that improves. But it, I really hope that people who live in wards where this is an issue just encourage and your worn-out constituents, please let us know because it's it's not good for um, the landlords or or the residents. Just let us know if they think, and we're really more than happy to check into it. And we're sorry sometimes that it's not actually an over occupancy, but many times it's not. So, so what I hear just to to follow up is that is that you have the tools, especially with things that council has done in the last six months, you have the tools to actually do something about. And it, our existing over occupancy law, the issue is just is just that we're, we have to increase inspections. It sounds like there's a set number of houses that are the problem, and 
if you had additional inspectors, you could go to those houses. And we had a registration program. We could pay for those inspectors. So, yeah. And Dennis. And as I remember, uh, some of the discussion previously in the previous council um, mentioned um, proposing that perhaps after the inspection or whether, uh, you know, when, when, a, when a, that each landlord would um, be required to post either publicly or in, in an ad what the legal occupancy of their home or their, their house was that they were offering to rent. It was a way of making everybody aware at the front door or in an ad how many people could um, could occupy a home legally if you were a student group, a group of friends wanting to you know, look for a rental apartment. And it was, um, I thought it was a thoughtful idea and um, I heard complaints from landlords that it would be a phenomenal cost to make these postings and yet I think that um, a sticker on the front door um, we'll certainly handle that, and it would um, make it clear how many people should be in the house if there's been such a judgment. We, we um, <clears throat> got pretty far along in proposing something of that nature, and it actually was something the, the West Urbana neighborhood thought better of simply for the reason that by posting the occupancy, you're stating this is a problem. You know, it, it's almost inviting that this is a neighborhood where we have occupancy problems and we we thought that that would be counterproductive and the neighbor group felt that would be counterproductive sort of like branding yourself as you know this is a student neighborhood that's occupancy problems and we felt that there there must be but less hotels, visible more persuasive hotels ways to deal are required with it. to do such things and um, uh, right. uh, restaurants are required to post um, right. you know their uh, the rating of their um, kitchen I mean, so it's not, I mean, I'd say that it's something that could be reviewed. It, it seemed to me that posting inside the unit would avoid that, but the problem was that we would not be able to check it without a search warrant. So the attorney didn't feel that that was a worthwhile alternative. But we went we went through all that and just posting on the outside of the unit we, we felt would have some down, downside consequences in stating this isn't an owner-occupied owner neighborhood. After all, it's rental, and not only that, but there's some, you know, problems, and we need to. It just. Well, maybe it's the size of the posting. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a seven by eight foot panel on the front property, but it could be just like a small two-inch, two-inch sticker on the front door or something. I'm mean, just saying. Other comments from committee members at this time. Brandon. I would be interested in hearing from Charlie if he's willing to briefly describe what he handed out, which is. Describe, if, because he's reviewed it and familiar with it, what the difference is between our rules and those in Macomb, Ann Arbor, um, East Lansing, and others. Okay, well, um, I have handed out a, a list of, of comparative of uh, functional family definitions. My thinking was that uh, um, you know, well, what I'm hearing on the street is that if you want to occupy a house with more than four bedrooms in it, uh, all you got to do is say your cousins, and and so that's the that's where this is coming from. A lot of these other communities set a a uh, tighter limit, two, three unrelated individuals. Uh, a lot of these other communi communities have a much tighter definition of family. Uh, they basically don't allow cousins as uh, as one of the family definitions. They make it. Um, um, you know, um, uh, a uh, level two kinship. So it could be a, a, a grandparent and uh, a, a grandchild type distribution, uh, stepchildren, uh, adopted children, foster care, so on. But they, they basically, the, the way the, the provisions are written, they don't allow cousins. Uh, or, you know, cousins would be allowed, but you would be within the, you'd be in the four unrelated or three unrelated, whatever their unrelated occupancy uh, limits would be. Um, so uh, I was, so what I put together is, is just a, a starting point of what we might do our, to, to tighten up our definitions. Now, one of the concerns was uh, nowhere in our provisions do we have a, a, um, um, a functional family definition so that a group of individuals that of unrelated individuals 
who can demonstrate that they live together as a family could continue to do so. Uh, so that's in here. And if you look at a lot of these definitions, they have family and they have functional family uh, uh, or something similar in their definitions. Um, other than that, I'm sort of open to, to, I'm looking for ways of tightening the definition. I mean, it could be just a simply matter of, of, of taking our existing stuff and saying a family is such and such and removing cousins from that list uh, and, and adding um, what a, a, a functional, uh, adding a functional family definition there. I mean, it, that could be as simple as what it is. And, and the more I think about it, that might be the better way to do it is define family and define functional family as part of this and, and, and leave the rest intact. Um, and it might be a little clearer that way. There. I wonder if we could get the um, definitions from Normal and from Evanston, because they probably have been through these same bells. Mm -hmm. I could try to get those, but did you, did you just not look at those? Uh, no, these are what I, I quickly got. Okay. Um, so. I have a question, Charlie. Is your goal to close the loophole, the cousin loophole, or is your goal to decrease the number of unrelated people who, who can live in a household from what we have now? Because I get mixed up when I read this. I think you're trying to do both, but you say you're doing one. Um, well, I'm trying to provide for a functional family definition, mm -hmm. okay, um, so that there is a, a way to allow more than five, four unrelated if in the rare occasion that it, that it really does exist. Um, I am trying to to get rid of the cousin loophole. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like, to, you know, basically a tighter definition of what four unrelated is. Um, the, the problem is, is that you have a house with five or six bedrooms. Uh, sometimes in these houses, the fifth and sixth bedrooms are converted basements, converted attics. Um, and and um, that, you know, again, that's an, Im it's an impact issue. You know these houses have been uh, have been converted to to maximize their uh, the, the 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 income stream, and by adding a, be a bedroom in the basement or adding a, be a bedroom in the attic, uh, it's it's increased things. Sometimes you know uh, I looked at converting my attic so they have more office space. I mean you know so I you know so it's perfectly legitimate reason for converting your attic, uh, and then. Uh, you know, 10 years from now, somebody else owns the house, and they say, oh, this will this will make a, a nice bedroom as a rental unit. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, so there are, and then there are the very large houses that were made to handle large families and now, you know, are, are would work fine if you were a large family but still own only one or two cars. But now the temptation is, of course, and it's not just temptation, it, it occurs. You've got six people living there with six cars. And so an alternative to all of this is simply to, to limit the number of cars that can be associated with a house or a unit. Uh, I think that's a much bigger item and that needs to be tackled separately. My immediate concern is, is to do something about closing the cousin loophole. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think rather than what I've got here on paper, I think uh, the, 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 what I propose is that, and, and, and maybe staff can come back with something in, in several weeks as part of their overall look, is that we define a functional family, that's uh, item three on this list, and that we, that we define a family in a tighter fashion, which would be item one on this list, uh, so that, so that uh, we don't have as many loopholes. Mm -hmm. Do we know, I heard the comments about impact, how it's affecting our community and all that. I think it's important to understand the total impact of what we're saying in terms of what this change might represent. How much staff time is involved, how many incidences per year, those kinds of things. Because if it's, um, if it's two or three, that's you know, one thing. If it's 25, that's another. But we have no clue as to what this impact really means. I don't have a clue. Um, maybe Dr. Tyler can address that concern. I don't understand if if we have a big issue with this, what is it? Last year we had six or seven complaints. Okay. 
There was, several years ago, there was actually a survey done, a snapshot done on how many over-occupied um, units there were in the West Urbana neighborhood, and it was something like 40. That was many, many years ago. Um, so it's, it's probably somewhere in between those numbers. I hope that we've mm -hmm. improved yeah. since then. Um, I, I do wish people would let us know of the concerns, because six or seven is not very much. I, I believe it's got to be more than that. Um, any complaint, we immediately go out not, and... Not that. I mean, in terms of... There's a certain degree of efficiency associated yeah. with dealing with problems like that within the city. And I would say you know, if it's six, it's one thing. But if it's 40, it's another. But I think that uh, if to legislate a family is interesting for me in the beginning. So it's that's it's something different. people feel very strongly about, the, the occupancy item. The strength of feeling is much greater than the number of complaints, and I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. Good. Well, I think it's regardless of the number of complaints, it's important for us to tighten uh, the ordinance because I think it has to do with the livability of our community. And I think it's also something that all of us heard from our constituents. I mean, certainly in the ward that I represent, it's not as significant issue as it is in some of the other wards, but um, it, it, it is across our whole community. So I, I certainly am supportive of, of tightening the ordinance. And I think I, what I hear Charlie saying is that in terms of moving forward with this particular issue, that you guys will look at this, staff will look at this as a part of our overall goals and then consider it as a one of our higher priorities because it is something that seems to be uh, dealt with potentially uh, with less staff time than certainly some of these other issues. This would be um, a text amendment and there could be council direction to draft a text amendment and then it follows a process where we go to the plan commission for public hearing. So this can happen regularly. You know, we we would like to see this text definition change, you know, whatever it is, suggest it knowing that plan commission or the, the hearing authority and they'll get input and they'll wordsmith. Um, we'll get legal input as well and we'll look at all the other ordinances. We have a big dictionary of planning definitions um, that include definitions of family units, functional units. So this of, you know, of the items, this is probably a pretty, um, the, the implications might be great, but in terms of the actual work, work to do forward, this is pretty direct. And you have a commission set up that's supposed to be looking at these items. So you could direct a text amendment to look at X, and then we would add it to our work plan and bring it to the next, you know, after all the research is done, we'll bring it to the plan commission. We could report back, but um, then they'll come from plan commission back to you, and, and then you can modify it if you need to. I would really be in favor of that, so we really understand what, what's, what's the impact and how it's affecting everybody. Because once they look at that, they're going to look at Farm Illinois and some of the other options and come up with a text change as to what Charlie might want. And I'd really be in favor of that. I think we'd come up with a, a good uh, overall view of what this is all about. Charlie. I guess I would ask that you take a look at the six pages that I sent you. It's not a real high quality paper. It's, it's trying to recycle some scrap paper there. Um, take a look at those. I can email these to you if you'd prefer it that way, and I will try to get a couple more items. But what I would propose to do is exactly that is, is, is if there's interest in tightening the definition. So if, if I could have a sort of a straw poll of is it worth my time to go out and try to find a tighter definition of this stuff? I know Lynn has said yes. Robert seems to be interested. Okay. There's another. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll work with staff. I'll get some more stuff, find it, and, 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 uh, and over the next um, month or two, uh, see if I can come up with a, a better way of looking at this, a tighter definition that works within our existing scheme. Um, uh, and and run it through the, the usual channels. But I'm interested in your reaction to the different aspects of the definitions that I've provided tonight. Uh, uh, feedback on that. I, I, I'm confused because I just heard 
Dr. Tyler say that we, we have an ordinance, we worked on tightening it actually in January, and that there's a, there's a big feeling about this issue. It, it, and, and the number of, of, time, of instances where we see the over-occupancy thing, the complaints coming in don't, don't necessarily match the feeling. So what, what we're about to do, what we're being asked to do is to spend staff time on this instead of something else, and to spend plan commission time on this and some, rather than something else. That's what we're being asked. So the question is opportunity costs. So I look at the proposal that Charlie has before us. There's three, there's essentially three items on here. Let, if I go backwards on the, from, from three, two, one, number three is actually already taken care of because we have a domestic partner registry. You can, if, if folks meet these criteria that look a lot like domestic partnership, they can actually register as domestic partners and are included in our ordinance. Number two is a description of our current ordinance. So number two is taken care of. We don't allow more than four people who are unrelated. So the only thing that's being added here is number one. That's the, so instead of asking people to spend a lot of time going through a large process, sending a plan commission to do a definition of family, I think, I, I've seen this before because we, we did it with the MOR, we did it with some other things where we spent a lot of staff time on a very small thing. And so I want us to be careful with our staff time before we move forward. Number one, the issue that I, I, the, I think the only thing really that's being proposed here is that if folk, if, if say there's two people related by blood or three people related by blood, there's only one other person that then is allowed to be in that household. So you can have a family related by blood and one other person, whereas currently you can have a family related by blood and three people. So all this is, the only thing that's being proposed in my mind here is that you can, you. You could have three additional people. This is going to go down to one. Let me give you an example of why I think this is a bad idea. I have, a, I have an ex-constituent. I, I, I know my, my prior constituents more than I know my, my current constituents in terms of getting to know them over time. I have an ex-constituent in, in Ward 4. They've lived in the neighborhood for 20 years. They're a couple living in a four-bedroom house with two boarders. That is the way that they're able to pay the mortgage on the house. If you limit the number of boarders to one person, they will probably not be able to afford to stay in that neighborhood. So I know of several other families that fit the same criteria. I have a person who lives across the street who rents to two boarders. They, they're a family of two retire, uh, close to retired um, age folks. They have no children in the house. They have a four bedroom house. Actually, I think they have a five bedroom house. One is a study, two boarders, and themselves having having uh, space in the house so you're going to tell my neighbor across the street that they have to essentially lose their owner occupied I don't I've never had any problems with noise litter trash paving nothing no problems from either of these people but you're about to say that those people aren't allowed to rent out those houses th those spaces you're looking at basically taking thirty six hundred dollars a year from that person. I don't think that that's okay. I don't think that we should go in that direction. I don't think the owner occupied is the problem. So I think we need to look at, look at what is really the problem here and get to that and, and, and narrow in on that and hit that problem. Instead of what I see this is, is casting this very wide net. It doesn't allow people to rent to more than one, even if there's two, a couple just living in a house. And if you look at some of these houses, you got five and six bedrooms living in a house. That's a situation where someone who's owner occupied living in the house is going to have to move out of the house and then you can get somebody to buy it and rent it out to foreign related people. So I, I just don't see that as, as solving this problem here. And I also don't see, I honestly, and I feel like we've heard this from staff at least twice tonight, that the over occupancy, it, that we just tightened it up and that actually they need help with getting inspectors into these into these houses and inspecting the properties. Let's do that. If we're going to spend plan commission time, we're going to spend taf staff time, let's get more housing inspectors. Let's deal with safety. Let's actually enforce our current occupancy ordinance because we've been told it's pretty much unenforceable without additional inspectors. So I don't know why we would actually work on the over occupancy ordinance if we've already been told it's unenforceable without inspectors. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I'm hearing people say this is the way to go and I just don't think it's the way to go.
Charlie. I don't think you heard what I said exactly right. Uh, what I said was, rather than look at look at it this way that I've defined, mm -hmm. okay, that one, and I'll, I'll, good enough, I think we need a functional family definition because the domestic registration is not sufficient. It doesn't, it doesn't get you as much as this functional family definition gets you. Okay. Um, the the real issue is, and that I'm trying to address with item number one. And, rec and recognize your concerns about, you know, basically how many people you can allow in the house is we need a tighter definition of what is, a f what is allowed as a family. So we can continue to have four unrelated people uh, or, you know, a family plus up to a certain number of, of individuals. Uh, but we have a loophole that is uh, being potentially abused. And yes, we need the inspections. We need the inspectors. And I said, you know, over the next month or two, uh, I can work with work with uh, the, work with staff on on developing some some uh, uh, maybe minor text changes that would accomplish uh, this. That won't take that much time. But like I said earlier, no one magic bullet is going to solve the problem. It's going to take a number of different things. This is only one small piece of the total package, which I think. Community development is already working on, or is already thinking about working on, and and how they flesh it out. I just think that that we do need we do have a loophole in there, and we need to close it. Other communities have much tighter definitions of family than we do, and when they have a tighter definition of family, they also put in a functional family uh, definition as well. Uh, I think uh, I think we can I think we can tweak the the, the current zoning ordinance uh, to accomplish uh, uh, what we wanted to do. I guess I'd rather see us just say um, related by blood but not cousins rather than saying something because what you said doesn't address the border issue that I described which is I don't know if they fit functional definition of family. These are people who rent by six months or a year or two folks who I don't think they consider part of their functional family. They're borders. They're two, they're, you know, Graduate students, postdocs, whatever. Yeah, but but, but you've them. described something that to me is still fits in the four persons unrelated. Uh, right. No, it's I agree. Four, oh, it's true. If it's four persons unrelated, but if you have four, if you have two folks and kids, then you get. Yeah, well, you, you yeah, but you still have a, you still you, you take the more liberal of the two definitions, and that's what works. That's what you apply here. So it's either you know you're a family in this way, or you're up to four unrelated, right. and whichever combination gets you gets you uh, meets the criteria so I, I, I'm not sure what you're objecting to there because I, I think they can, can I, I don't see a problem with what you described as their current arrangement it, it's it's legal under the I'm not changing the current you know they they, they meet that de they meet the current criteria all I'm trying to do is get rid of a loophole and I'm trying to add functional family mm -hmm. which I think is is is, is something mm -hmm. uh, is a good thing mm -hmm. so I, I'm trying to both Add add a feature and take away a loophole mm -hmm. uh, in doing this, and I think I think that's something to be done with minor text changes. Libya suggested, and it's part of the total package. Uh, and and maybe if it's done right, it can be part of a several things that are done all at once by plan commission, so that it does minimize their time. I agree. We want to minimize uh, the use of, of staff time on getting this done, and I'll you know. But and, and if and if some other community has done it. Uh, all the more, all the more reason to, to use it. That's why I've got six or seven or eight different examples here. I grabbed the one that seemed to fit best within our existing zoning, and would take the minimum number of changes to get it worked in. But I think there's an even easier way, and, and Libby has suggested it. Other comments? Okay. If not, uh, I guess the question is what the action item, what relevant action item should be asked staff to. They've made an offer to bring something back to us in terms of. Um, yeah, I think that's sufficient. Family. Yeah. So we'll wait for that. Okay, is there consensus on that then? Yes. Right. So next we have this is our last item, ordinance number 2005 <coughs> -137, an ordinance revising the annual budget ordinance. This refers to the police review board training. Uh, Mayor, would you like to present on this? Well, <clears throat> there is a conference of the National Association for Civilian Oversight, and it's going to be in Miami and in um, October. And this is a national meeting where people are going to be discussing what works in um, 
civilian review boards for police so i think that we should send some people i'm proposing sending four people and this would be the cost so as to add six thousand dollars to the budget to cover it the estimates five thousand nine hundred and one dollars and twelve cents but that's only an estimate i don't think it's going to be more than that but i think it's an investment in um getting people well informed any questions people i want to oh do you want to know who i want to send yeah actually that's okay okay i would like to send um the assistant police chief mike beely the president of the fraternal order of police anthony cobb uh jen walling from this the committee that proposed this and i would like to go because i worked on this for many years okay so uh is there a motion so moved. We have a motion is there a second second i would second it a motion by robert a second by charlie any discussion if not the, all those in favor signify by saying aye What's that? Either one, Brendan. No. Yeah, he's louder than me. Well, on. no, Brendan's fine. Okay. Second by Brandon. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, that carries, and we are now adjourned. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me see on it. <laughs>